Spectrum Recruiting Program at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. If this is your first time with us, we're now conducting quarterly veteran showcases to help both spotlight our veterans and educate the lab on our veterans, as well as the amazing work they did serving our nation, as well as the uh, laboratory. This will always be an accompanied supporting article you can read on Newsline following the showcase. Considering we are just two days away from Veterans Day, I thought I would share some brief history on this important, uh, this important holiday. Veterans Day, originally known as Armistice Day, is a federal holiday in the United States observed annually on November 11th for honoring military veterans of the United States Armed Forces. Major hostilities of World War I ended at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918 when the armistice with Germany went into effect. At the urging of major U.S. veteran organizations, Armistice Day was renamed Veterans Day in 1954. Before we get started, just a reminder to please re remain on mute during the interview. Feel free to leave questions or comments in the chat during the interview. We'll be sure to get to all of the questions when the interview is complete. Uh, this event will be recorded. We'll be sharing pictures throughout the showcase uh, with high participation. We ask everyone if you're not speaking to come off a of video to save bandwidth. So I'd like to start by introducing our laboratory's deputy director, Carolyn Zirkel, who is our strong advocate in supporting our military and veterans serving throughout our laboratory and will be introducing us to our guest of honor, James Jones. Carolyn, you have, you have the floor. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'd just like to say on behalf of myself and Kim Budell, the director, and also Pat Falcone, the deputy director of science and technology, we are really proud of these showcases that Sean has put together on a quarterly basis. We're also very proud to showcase our staff members that work here at Livermore who have served time in the armed forces. Um, we really do want to exemplify the laboratory's commitment to veterans and armed forces service members, and in particular, have a strong recruiting and retention program for our veterans. Uh, we have the pleasure, including myself, of meeting James Jones this morning. Um, James is an Army veteran, third generation military, and he joined the Army at the age of 17, and he retired after 28 years, a full career of honorable service. Uh, James will go into his background, his path to joining the military, and the details of experience serving with us today. He'll also cover the impact of his service to Livermore, which he's worked at since 2005. And James is currently the Deputy Assurance Manager and the Directorate Security Officer for Physical and Life Sciences. Um, I would just like to say, James, I was unbelievably impressed with your background and your experience and also your work here at Livermore. And we have a little bit in common. Uh, I've just recently moved here from New Mexico, and I know you are a New Mexico State Aggie. I root for the Aggies in football and, and basketball also and your connection to Jemez Pueblo, which was very close to where I lived and a beautiful area in the state of New Mexico. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Sean. Is that correct? Yep, thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate that. Thank you for your support to our military and veterans serving our lab. I'd like to introduce Charles Ball, our Deputy Chief of Staff for the laboratory, Charles. Thanks, Sean. Um, you know, when you, when Sean and I were um, preparing for this and talking to James ahead of time, you know, I was struck by the fact that so often we look to our history books, to television, to movies uh, for our heroes. Uh, we don't have to do that here at Livermore because we've got them uh, living right here within our midst. And James Jones is certainly one of those people. Uh, I look at his record; it's just astounding um, the operations that he was involved in Panama the first Gulf War Afghanistan Guantanamo the second Gulf War um, when the call went out he met he he answered the call and uh, I'm <clears throat> I'm just very honored to be on a WebEx with someone who has put his life on the line for me over to you Sean Charles, thank you. Thank you for those words. They mean a lot. 
I think all of us that have served um, to see your emotion and how much you care about this means a great deal to me and a great deal to James and a great deal to the, uh, to the laboratory. Thank you for supporting th this effort. Um, with that said, I am going to start to I'm going to start start the interview with James. And uh, James, welcome. Um, can you, James, can you summarize a little bit for us what you did in in your job? Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, honored to be here, and uh, thank you for those kind words and introduction. Um, currently, I'm the deputy assurance manager and directed security officer for the physical life sciences principal associate directorate. Uh, I'm tasked with uh, help and advise assist the PLS pad. An assurance manager uh, as a subject matter expert and liaison to external and internal sponsors, senior management regarding compliance with DOE safety and security orders and integration of those policies procedures into across the varying programs and disciplines. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, I help oversee components of safety and security. Um, and provide guidance to the programs uh, as far as safety and security. Basically, in a nutshell, I help us stay online by making sure we're doing the right things and we're doing things right in regard to safety and security in PLS. Well said, James. I, I, you know, you really appreciate that role when you start to better understand when you hear it coming from somebody like yourself. Um, thank you. So uh, just for, for the audience, I'm going to share my screen here, so bear, bear with me. We're going to share some pictures as we talk to James throughout the, uh, th throughout the time here. So James, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, childhood and a little bit about where you were raised? Uh, yes. Uh, first, I'd like to say to fully understand, you know, how I was raised, uh, you have to first know a little bit about my ethnic background. Um, I am of African American and Native American descent. I'm an enrolled member of the Diné tribe from the Navajo Nation in uh, Arizona. Um, basically, in you know formal uh, Navajo introduction, I would be uh, James Jones Inishia, being for twenty initially. Nakaitha Jenny Bashachin, Montes Gizni Dashiche, Nakaitha Lishini Dashinale, Ceylon Etan Nasha. So basically, in Navajo, I basically introduce myself by my clans, my, my maternal clans and paternal clans and the clans of my grandparents to let you uh, identify and know where I come from, where my family comes from. So basically, I am a member of the Bink Patorni or Deer Springer clan, also the Montes Gizni, which is the Coyote Pass Hemis clan, which has uh, that gets its origins from the Hemis Pueblo. That is from my grandfather's side. So I was born in Kansas City, Kansas, um, but I grew up on the Missouri side in an area called Parade Park near the 18th Street, uh, 18th and Vine Jazz District, the historic jazz, jazz district. Uh, literally lived across the street from Arthur Bryant's, the world famous barbecue there, uh, known as the President's Choice, and grew up playing sports on historic fields there that are now part of the uh, Negro League Museum and the Kansas City Youth ba uh, Baseball Academy. Um, uh, the pictures there you see are, are of 18th Vine and the uh, Kansas City Skyline, uh, which I live very, very close to the downtown area, and that uh, monument there is known as the Scout. Uh, all my life, I've excelled in ath uh, athletics, uh, come from athletic background. I was a star athlete um, my entire life, uh, football, wrestling, baseball, and track. Um, but growing up in Kansas City, uh, being a multi-ethnic, multicultural guy, my mom made sure that we knew our culture. So we spent all holidays and summers back in Arizona uh, on my grandfather's place up on the Navajo Reservation. is basically living a ranch lifestyle where I basically learned my culture, uh, learned everything. You know, most people would be shocked by this, how to ride, rope, shoot, hunt, farm chop wood, raise horses and break horses, uh, raise cattle, sheep, etc. We basically lived a, a native culture. We learned our customs language, how to live and be self-sufficient or what people now call off the grid lifestyle. Uh, I used to love going out there because uh, as a kid growing up in the city, you weren't allowed to do anything, but out on the res, uh, we would go and we had jobs, you know, um, you know, my mom was one of 10 kids growing up, so 
many cousins there and we would get assigned jobs you you and you go go get the horse and saddle those horses and go down and find the rest of the cows and bring them to water and bring them back or you know we're tasks like that we learned how to do those things and i loved it because we had responsibility and we were allowed to do things now um my grandfather on my father's side was also a horseman but he is from the kansas city kansas area uh specifically uh leavenworth kansas and he had a ranch out there where we had horses there um shetland ponies and others um my grandfather on that side his name was james luther jones he was also a world war ii veteran and a member of the last uh buffalo soldier regiments um in the army he was in the 10th and 20th cavalry primarily known like i said as buffalo soldiers and uh also did time in North Africa and in Italy during World War II. So horses were a big part of our culture and it was a big part of my life coming up and growing up. So some of the photos you see were are some of my family members on uh, both sides, you know, how we practice our culture. Uh, I come from humble means, you know, it's just a cool way of saying poor, but my mom always said that uh, we were rich in tradition, rich in culture, <clears throat> uh, rich in uh, family and rich in love. Get a little emotional because, uh, you know, I lost my mom just a couple years ago, but she's the backbone of our family and she raised us well and she uh, set us up for success and um, made us strong. James, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And Shake, thank you for sharing uh, the rich heritage in, in history with your family. We don't, you know, you and I have known each other for, for many years and you think you know somebody until you really spend uh, some real quality time together. So thank you. This is, uh, this is, this is awesome. Tell, tell us a little bit more about your family gro growing up, James. Well, uh, see, my parents, they met in college in Kansas. Uh, my dad, played football. He, he was running back at Fort Hayes State, then later on at Texas Western University, which is UTEP, uh, which happens to be the arch rival of my school, New Mexico State. Um, and then later he was drafted by Pittsburgh Steelers in 66, uh, suffered a really bad knee injury, later played for the Kansas City Chiefs briefly. But like I said, he suffered a career ending injury at the first year, um, you know, didn't know it was over, but it was his career was cut pretty short because of that. Uh, but ultimately, my dad actually ended up uh, working for the DOE and retiring from the Kansas City plant for 35 years. Um, I, for a lot of years, I, as a kid, I didn't know what he did, you know, because of the clearance. He didn't talk about it, you know, until I actually I joined the military and got a clearance that he actually told me where, what he did and where he worked. I knew he worked for, you know, the, it was, I think, the Bendix Corporation at the time. And that's really all I knew what he did. He didn't really talk about it. But. Um, it was very interesting. Like I said, my mom's one of 10 children. Uh, my mom has spent her life uh, championing Native American issues. Uh, she, at one point, she was the director of the American Indian Center of the Greater Kansas City and worked for another program called Morningstar Lodge. It was a substance abuse uh, rehab, excuse me, counseling program. And then later, after we moved back to the Navajo Reservation, she did 35 years there working for the Division of Labor where she championed, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you know about the Navajo Reservation, it's probably about the size of uh, West Virginia, but it's uh, basically a food desert. And one of my mom's big accomplishments was helping bring the Bashes chain to the Navajo Reservation, basically 11 grocery stores up there. That was probably one of her major accomplishments working with the Bashes Corporation to help them bring it there, but also to have it incorporated, be native run and supported by you know bringing jobs to the reservation uh let's see my mom and dad um like i said in college uh they're the first in our families on both sides to graduate they graduated with aa degrees um academics was always something that was preached to us um by my mom uh my dad my my grandfather on my mom's side you know he only had a sixth grade sixth grade education but he saw the value in it and he made sure that uh my aunts and uncles all went to school uh, there. Again, like I said, uh, come from athletic family, football's literally in my blood. Uh, I have three brothers, two sisters, we're all raised, you know, my strong values, culture, work ethic, academic sport, and humor. Uh, if you've ever been around me or my family, you know, we like to laugh and we like to have a good time. Uh, 
like I said, athletics competition was big, uh, huge, you know, in my community in Kansas City. And then, but also out of Navajo Reservation, uh, we moved there permanently uh, my eighth grade year to be closer to family. My grandfather was getting up in age and was getting, you know, had some health issues. So we moved back. Uh, you know, it was a bit of a culture shock moving back because uh, when we're back visiting, you know, we're just having fun during the summers, doing the ranch, you know, style lifestyle. But then once you moved out there, you start to notice things like there's infrastructure that was seriously missing, you know, like, you know, you're getting an eighth grade you get, get into those years where you want to go hang out at the mall and go to the movies. And then you're like, wow, there's no movie theater. There's no mall here. You know, the, these things were hours away, some two, you know, three, four hours away. Sometimes we'd have to go to go to Phoenix or Flagstaff or Gallup, New Mexico, just to experience these things. So a bit of a culture shock there when, you know, when you, when you uh, move uh, from the city back to the reservation, big, big uh, disparity in, uh, amenities and quality of life and different things like that. Um, but like I said, I excelled in athletics. Uh, um, I had opportunity to play at a high level. Um, I was, I was recruited in high school, but you know, not as heavily as I guess I could have been because of where I played out on the Navajo reservation. It's not necessarily a hotbed for athletics, but I still had the opportunity to go to junior college. I uh, was a second team All American there, tight end. Uh, I was academic All American as well. Like I said, that was always something that was beat into us, uh, not beat into us, but preached to us on a daily was af- academic excellence, was the student athlete emphasis on student first, athlete second. Um, I was nominated as a Kodak All American while I was at New Mexico State. And then, um, as you see from the photos, uh, my dad played my I played my brothers played as well as the last photos of my son who is currently you now in New Mexico State and I'm proud to say he's playing the same position I did and is actually wearing the same jersey number so uh something I'm really proud of and I really support and uh you know but it's basically entrenched in our blood James thank you thank you for uh for sharing all that detail about your family and and where you grew up and uh and um you know it's 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 humbling to to hear some of the challenges you had and and who you've become and who your who your son has become and what kind of father and person you are and uh, it's just again very 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 humbling thank thank you um, James want if you could please share share a little bit about your your educational background with with us please okay my education background um, basically for me I had to join I didn't you know like I said I come from humble means. Didn't have the money to go to school. Uh, Didn't get the opportunity to play football or sports right away. I got a lot of partial scholarships. So I took them on myself to find money to go to school and I joined Army to get uh, money to go to school. Uh, Started out after my, you know, tours in the military, got out after Desert Storm and uh, pursued a, I went to junior college first. I received a an A there, then my BA at New Mexico State. Well, once I was playing there, I had the opportunity here at the lab to go to the Bush School and pursue some graduate level education there. I was a graduate of uh, the Bush School and National Security Affairs. Uh, great program for anyone here at the lab. If you get an opportunity to do it, I say do it. Uh, I received my MA in Executive uh, Management and Public Administration from Golden Gate University recently. And then I've gone to various uh, military schools, Army Combat Engineer School, Field Artillery School, also the Air Defense School, and then the Army Command Jest General Staff College uh, for Information Operations as my functional area at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. So um, that's just some of the schools I've, uh, I've highlighted there. But education is always there and always pursuing it. And I'm debating pursuing a PhD now. I just don't know if I can... Uh, motivate myself to do that right now but it's it's definitely on my mind you know james as long, long as i've known you you've always been a lifelong uh learner it's really it's just it's it's great to hear about your educational your training your background um the bush school just a fantastic school and for those in the audience if you haven't had a chance to go just a phenomenal opportunity that uh we continue to uh, to uh, provide here james tell us um tell us a little bit about uh when did you join the military 
Uh, joined right out of high school at 18, I mean, at 17, uh, wasn't old enough to sign the papers, had to get my mom to sign. Uh, uh, I went in with a plan. Like I said, I, I didn't get the recruiting offers that I thought I would, you know, they basically told me that, uh, I was, you know, I had schools talk to me and they, they basically said, Hey, you're playing against substandard opponents. You're supposed to do these things and the things you're doing, you're supposed to do. So I always knew in the back of my mind that I could play. And I wanted to prove it. So I went into the military, uh, talked to some recruiters and found out they actually had football in Germany. And I went in specifically on a mission to go to Germany to play football while I was in the army, but also to secure money to go to college via the GI Bill and Army College Fund. And that's what I did uh, um, at the age of 17. And um lived it out, you know, obviously got sent in where there was a couple of wars that got thrown in there that I wasn't, you know, uh, wasn't part of the plan, but Hey, that, you know, I took the oath and I towed the line and I, I served with, uh, you know, with, with gave all I get, I, I could give, you know, uh, I'm very proud of my service. Yeah, James, we are, we are proud uh, of your service as well. And it's, you know, we, you, you and I both have a lot in common there, both, uh, working hard to play college football and serve in our nation. So you, uh, we really appreciate the path that you took. You know, when we talk about that path, um, what or who influenced you to join the uh, military? Uh, I was, man, I was heavily influenced by my family's history of service. Uh, you know, previous state of my grandfather, my dad's side served in North Africa and, and, and uh, Italy and Europe in World War II. Uh, very proud of that he was, uh, you know, part of the last mounted Buffalo Soldier Regiment, the 28th, uh, before they disbanded and turned into the 10th, and then uh, ultimately the 12th Cavalry. But uh, that was something that always was a sense of pride. Every time I went into combat, um, all every vehicle I had, I had Buffalo Soldier painted on there as a moniker. Um, on my mom's side, I have my mom's uncles, first cousins, uh, were Navajo code talkers that served in the Marines. You know, one particular was Teddy Draper Jr. It was one of my mom's uncles and others, Kai Gorman and others. There's others that, uh, you know, didn't make it back, but it was always something that was there, the stories we knew um, of their service, you know, even though for a long time they weren't allowed to even get recognition from the federal government because of, it was a classified program. I don't believe they got a formal recognition until the 80s. Uh, you know, but uh, I knew the stories. I had uncles serving in Vietnam. My uncle there, the photo there, uh, Edward, he retired as a master sergeant, uh, served in the Korean War. He uh, joined the Army at 15, lied about his age. You know, he was he was born on the reservation, uh, didn't have a birth certificate, basically lied about his age and went and saw the world, you know. And it was someone uh, I really looked up to. He taught me how to shoot. Uh, when I was in high school and I was in JRTC, uh, he taught me how to shoot shine boots. I was on the rifle team, you know, and, uh, the, the things he taught me, you know, we were a champion state championship rifle team in Arizona. Um, I learned from him I already knew. And then our culture, you know, on the, on being a Navajo and being a warrior, uh, you know, we're taught in Navajo culture, you get up every morning to run, just like you do in the military. You're supposed to run towards the sun and yell and, uh, it's, it's like, uh, you know, let the, let your prayers be heard at that time, you know, by, by the, uh, by the ancient ones and by the, by what we call DN, you know, God, the, the gods. And it's just a part of, uh, Navajo culture was being tough. You know, I remember being as a kid, uh, we were, you, you know, it might sound brutal to some, but we were thrown into the snow, uh, naked as children, because it's supposed to make you tough. You know, it's part of. The culture, uh, but my grandfather, my culture really inspired me. Uh, my grandfather was my hero, man. On on my mom's side, uh, he he always taught us that we were you know we're called Nebahi, or warriors, and and Navajo language is really a descriptive language. So, who you talk to, there's different uh, can be different uh, descriptions or definitions of a word, you know. So that like for my grandfather and my mom used to tell me the body was it was like it didn't it was meant warrior but it also meant different things like my grandfather would say it was 
the one who could make it through the storm or the one who could survive or the one who could deliver the message, you know, somebody who could, you could count on to do something, you know, critical that was vital to, you know, the survival of, of that individual or the clan, you know, that's the way I was taught, you know, then we're also taught that we were Natani, we were leaders. My grandfather used to tell us that all the time that we were protectors, you know, um, protectors of those that could not protect themselves and, and we were supposed to protect the land, you know, as, as, uh, Navajo men, you know, the philosophy was something that was entrenched in me from as long as I can remember, um, you know, my brothers have served. I have cousins that have served, um, uh, um, both male and female, um, from, you know, desert storm to the Marines, army, air force, every, every, I think every service with except for the coast guard uh, someone in my family has served you know um and a lot of them retiring from service and you know using the army as a way of making a better life it's definitely a family affair it's definitely something that's revered in our family and uh continues to be um but that that's who influenced me and how i was influenced uh about joining the military you know and it was it was something that was a sense of pride and something that's revered in our culture Wow, James, just uh, so much depth, you know, again, whether it's the the Buffalo Soldier re re uh, Regiment the we learned a lot recently about the about the uh, Marine Corps no Navajo code talkers and just to hear um, your family and your sacrifice uh, really just quite quite a, quite an influence there. Tell tell us about your military career. Okay, uh, I started out as an enlisted soldier. Uh, I joined, uh, became an combat engineer and then later army sapper, uh, specialized in explosive and combat operations, small unit tactics, et cetera. Um, uh, I chose it because initially I wanted to be a, you know, I, I was going in, I was like, I had two options. I wanted to do something where I could come out, either have a civilian skill and an air traffic controller was actually my first option. Uh, there was a two year waiting list, you know, I was like, man, I might not want to be in the military in two years. So. My next option was I want to do something that I would could never ever do on the civilian side, and it was explosives. I wanted to, you know, hey, I'm gonna go learn how to blow stuff up, you know, and just have fun doing that. And uh, uh, that was my first MOS was uh, was 12 Charlie, then later reclasses 12 Bravo combat engineer. Then uh, after initial tour, you know. I was only going to come in there and I was only supposed to join for two years and be done and get out and go right to college. Um, I got in there and I was good at it. You know, I excelled. I'm, I made sergeant and like a week before my 19th birthday, you know, um, it was, I just was a natural at it. You know, later changed him West was offered a 40,000 bonus. I reclassed to work in air defense with Patriot missiles and stinger missiles as a singer missile chief. Uh, section chief, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was something that was fast and furious, you know, like, uh, the photos that you're showing down there, the one in the greens, I look, you know, look at my arms, I was getting anywhere back then, but I was, uh, that was, I was getting ready to go to Panama, um, in 1989, uh, we were ordered to, to go down there by, uh, the president to help, uh, provide security and show of force. Uh, this is part of, it was at the time, this is part of the just cause operation, but it was called operation sand flea and operation Nimrod dancer. Um, we we're there as part of the fifth infantry division that went down. There was a fifth infantry division and the seventh light that was out of Monterey over here, Fort Ord, uh, went down. So part of that was, uh, there was a lot of, uh, there was, it was weird. There was a lot of things I didn't know at the time, but it was a lot of deception that was going on, uh, where we were doing all these exercises and we had no clue what was going on. And what we were doing was actually conditioning the public, you know, cause I guess they knew years out that we were going to go down there, but it was, uh, to prevent them from knowing when we we're going to go. So we would do these, uh, uh, massive moves we'd get on and, uh, they called them EJRIs, emergency deployment readiness exercises, where we'd literally get called, load on a plane, load all our equipment on trains, and literally go and fly to California or fly to Texas or fly. Like one time, I think we flew for 20 hours straight and turned around and landed in the same spot. You know, 
So we did a lot of that to condition the public and the media. So when the mission actually popped off and we left for real, they would just thought it was a training mission. And next, you know, we're in Panama and, uh, uh, things change. But, uh, after that, I went straight from there to, uh, Germany and then soon got deployed nine 11. Uh, I mean, not sorry, not nine 11, a desert storm. I'm sorry. And then I left service after desert storm, uh, and decided, you know, it was, I did my time. I did two combat tours and it was time to pursue my dream, you know, playing football. Um, I did that, had a great time playing football, chased some NFL dreams around, got to the doorstep. You know, I got to what they say to have the cup of coffee, but didn't quite make it. Uh, then I re-entered service after 9-11 uh, with my brother, um, where I came back and I served as a Ford observer. Uh, I just felt when 9-11 happened, uh, I just felt the sense of duty that, you know, it was unfinished business that we had to go and, you know, uh, we just had to had to serve and we both went down and we both entered re, uh, re-entered service. Uh, after that, you know, immediately deployed again. Uh, I was a uh, Ford observer, uh, was part of, uh, did a lot of fire support, which is a lot of what we call CAS, close air support, calling in missions, uh, airstrikes, et cetera. Uh, I was a team leader on a combat optical lasing team or a cold team, uh, achieved the rank of staff sergeant um, prior to that. And then uh, I went to officer candidate school. Then right before officer candidate school, I got promoted to E7, started first class. Um, and then it served the remainder of my career as an officer. I served as a field, tri- field artillery officer with secondary infantry and a functional area of information operations, which consists of, you know, cyber operations, electromagnetic magnetic activities and magnetic, electromagnetic spectrum activities, OPSEC, military deception, intelligence, you know, uh, supporting information warfare. Oh, just a gamut of things that I was blessed to uh, serve, you know, in some high level operations. I, I guess I was blessed or cursed, depending on how you look at it. That's what some of my, my buddies would say. Um, but uh, finished out my career, uh, served almost five years with the Australian Defense Forces and JIDO, supporting intelligence combat operations. Uh, I was with the uh, the second commando regiment of uh, their special operation engineering regiment or what they call SOAR in uh, Canberra and supporting global operations, uh, primarily with Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan, uh, some UN missions out of Africa, and then the uh, Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq, uh, Syria, and the surrounding Middle East. So in a nutshell, that sums up my career, I guess. And, you know, I've had deployments, like I said, to Panama, Desert Shield, Storm, Provide Comfort, Operation Southern Watch, uh, OEF, OIF, Armored Falcon, JTF Gitmo, Iraqi Freedom, and the Hair Resolve, just to name a few. Um, uh, that, in a nutshell, is it. Wow, James, uh, thank you. You know, it's again, very, when you think of 28 years, both enlisted and officer side, uh, we in the Marine Corps call that a Mustanger. I don't know what they call it in the army, but uh, quite a quite an extensive service. When you, when you think about all of your service, tell us about, you know, what was your, what was your highlight? Uh, I'd say the highlight of my career was when I became a commander in my command time in Taji, Iraq. Um, it is really because of the, the personal relationships that form, uh, the respect, trust, uh, reverence for the, and, you know, I, I had, I was, I was a lucky commander. I had some of the best soldiers and Americans that you could ever serve with. You know, it was, uh, one of, one of my, outside of my first, you know, initial exposure to the military it was the best, you know, we're, we're in some stressful, violent situations but it was the most fulfilling and i have to say fun time not not the combat side but just being with the guys and leading these troops was one of the the most fulfilling times in the military you know 
Uh, I'm proud to say, you know, we de we successfully deployed. We served in one of the most violent areas of Iraq in the heart of the Sunni Triangle. Um, we definitely made a difference, uh, and we safely returned all of my troops. Uh, you know, so that's something I was really proud of. You know, um, I had an organic 250 Jake troops, uh, a couple of platoons of augmented soldiers from the 24th Infantry Division, and then also a detachment of Ugandan soldiers uh, that were organized in a Sec 4 Enhanced Infantry Company. Uh, we're tasked with interior security of Camp Taji as well as exterior and quick reactionary force for the surrounding communities of Al Taji uh, and Nazaria Village, and then uh, the MSR Tampa area all the way to the Baghdad Gate. Um, it was just, uh, man, I, like I said, I've never enjoyed serving with a bunch of guys. You know, as a commander, your success, you know, rides on, you know, you ride on the back of your soldiers. And I was blessed to have some outstanding soldiers. You know, a lot of guys will say like, oh, I had 258 troops or 300 or 400, but I also worked for those guys. You know, the, my job was to make sure that they had the training, resources, equipment to successfully do their mission as, as well as provide them with good leadership, you know, uh, and, and to keep them motivated, keep them safe and secure to do our mission. And like I said, make a difference. Uh, it was something that I'm very, very proud of. Those same group of soldiers, uh, uh, later we came back, I, I transferred to the reserves. Uh, but those gentlemen went on to train the uh, Ukrainian forces as part of the California Army National Guard. Uh, the, so I'm really proud. I, I'm not gonna take credit. I cannot take credit and will not take credit for what they did in Ukraine, but there's a small piece of me. I feel like, you know, I had some, a little bit to do with that and I have a connection there and those guys have gone over and uh, I really credit them with the success of what's going on with the Ukrainian army, you know, during this whole uh, Russian invasion, you know, they, that, that just a testament to the professionalism and the quality of soldiers that I was blessed to have uh, and led in combat. James, you've got a uh, you've got a great perspective, and again, coming back from your enlisted time, and as being an officer, and really just hearing you talk about how valuable the troops are and how how much they mean to you as a leader, um, and it's 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 amazing, and um, again, highly appreciated for the sacrifice that you've made for this nation uh, and for 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 the globe. So, uh, I just want to th thank you. Uh, how has the military, James, impacted you as a person? Um, as a person, um, uh, being in combat definitely impacted me on a personal level. You know, uh, you know, they say every every person who's been a, in a foxhole or been in harm's way has had a dear God moment or a, a conversation with God. You know. Um, and I've had a few uh, few things stand out, I guess. Uh, the first time, I guess, my first real dear God moment was uh, seeing the breach um, during Desert Storm. Um, I was, a, like I said, I did, I was part of a Patriot Battalion, which um, they actually, the battalion I was assigned to was the first Normally, Patriot is an air defense asset that is a rear echelon asset, and they chose to deploy this forward with troops. So I was a forward observer, and I did RSOP or reconnaissance for the Patriot battalions. Well, the Patriot task force was com com comprised of Patriot Hawk and, and other uh, air defense technology Avengers and things like that at the time. We have nothing that was mobile that could go. and. So what we did is we provided secondary air defense for the task force as they moved. So we'd go forward, recon forward sites and gather intelligence, uh, but also provide secondary air defense with Stinger missiles as the main attack force moved. But then we'd also go back and serve as the guides to bring them up to the new area. So my dear God moment was, uh, when we were doing the left hook move, we had to go back and basically bring 
coming out of Iraq and back down and bring a unit up, uh, probably the equivalent of like driving from here to LA and bring them up convoying through the desert over open terrain uh, and doing it at night in complete darkness. And there's units maneuvering our around. We're already firing rounds and, you know, the potential for friendly fire and different things are there. But then it was the next morning when we made it, you know, we, we got the guys there safely, but seeing the breach, the magnitude of, you know, what it was, it was, I knew we we're going to war. There was nothing, you know, the, the government and, and President Bush at the time were still negotiating or having dip, diplomatic discussion with Saddam, but I knew right then that it was this, there was no way we were, this was going to happen. It was like, a, reminding me of a football kickoff, you know, kickoff team, just as far as you could see tanks, artillery, troops. And I, you know, happened to be a, probably on the only hill out there. And that was like, oh my God. And my dear God moment was, you know, God, you get me out of this. And, you know, um, I'm going to, <clears throat> hold on. Take your time, take, 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 take your time, James. Oh, man, what is this, the Oprah show? <laughs> uh, what my dear God moment was, you know, uh, to basically, I looked at my life, you know, and laid out, uh, laid out what I wanted to do with it and made that promise. Yeah, James, uh, it's, it's something that I think, um, both of us share is both sharing and in, in working yeah. and fighting in De Desert Storm together. So I could, right. um, I understand the sacrifice and, and I think yeah. we all understand and appreciate you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I laid, sure. I laid it the plan, you know, I, I get emotional because I haven't thought about this, you know, some of this stuff in a long time, but uh, basically laid out the plan for my life. I was like, you know, you get me out of here. I'm, I'm going to college. I'm going to play football. You know, at the time I, I didn't even have a girlfriend, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm going to start a family and do these things. And, you know, it's a, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough dichotomy. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, the things you have to do there, you're, it, it goes against all your moral fiber and what you're brought up to do, but, you know, you have to justify your means and, you know, you're there to do a job. And, and at the same time, you know, you're a, you're a leader and leadership is paramount there you know i was in a leadership role even though i was 19 years old you know it's a you know you you you'll make out this plan that during that you know dear god moment you know is it i i i laid out my life plan you know and uh and i have to say i i did everything you know i got out of there i successfully got out of there and, and um i did everything i laid out and promised to myself and to to the lord at the time, uh, but doing that, you know, pursuing education, uh, I have, uh, beautiful children, you know, I, everything that I set out to do, you know, um, and it is, I don't know, it's an emotional thing for me because it, 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 it was a really personal and, um, moment of self, uh, actualization and, uh, yeah self-awareness you know yeah yeah james thank you for sharing that yeah. thank you I, you know it's not easy um those of us that served and those of us that are war fighters and to share what you just shared um yeah. I, I, I have i have a little more to add though to that too so okay. that's probably one other thing but another thing that impacted me as far as uh the military was you know i've i've always been a competitive strong confident person but the military it, it definitely strengthened that and my personal values it reinforced uh my moral compass uh moral courage um you know all the professionalism side of the house and you know, organizational management skills and and public speaking as well because you get thrown into the fire you know you know how it is you are thrown into the fire and groomed from leadership from the day you're there and it's just the nature of the business you know due to potential attrition but uh you know those things have always happened the military taught me you know how to take initiative in the absence of orders. You know, these are things that, uh, you know, I still do 
to this day. It taught me how to, you know, the, the, the importance of communication and that's two way communication, you know, feedback is important. And, you know, that whole loop is of understanding. And then, and it also, it, it taught me the true importance of leadership and what it means to be a leader to your troops or, or employees. You know, I was a 19 year old Sergeant in desert storm, man, you know, and at the time when I got promoted, you know, it was like, it was more of a pay grade, you know, I looked at it, it was like, I was getting paid more money, but when I got out there in the desert, you know, you see grown men crying, man, that, uh, and I'm talking like grown men where I was 19 and I literally had guys that were twice my age, old enough to be my dad or guys that had kids older than me. And I was, you know, in charge of them and, uh, seeing guys crying, you know, fearful crying, you know, yeah. It was, you know, guys knew my background. It was used to be funny. There were guys who would come over begging to be in my squad or something. And, you know, there was like Jones is from Arizona, man. You know, he knows how to survive. He's going to get us out of this, you know. And I'm I'm afraid, too, you know, where I'm like, dude, I, I'm from Arizona, man. We have, you know, <laughs> swimming pools and golf courses. Dude, what are you talking about? Sprinkler systems, man. You know, <laughs> you know, the, like I was some, you know you know, Rambo or something, but, you know, that's what they believe because people le believe in leadership. They want that leadership. So that really taught me the importance of, of your role of being a leader, people looking up to you and believing that you're going to be the guy that's going to help them and direct them and guide them and have them successful. So, uh, seeing that, that, that is definitely something, um, uh, you know, that has been impactful and for me that, you know, employees, troops, whatever you want to call them, they deserve good leadership. And it's your job as a leader, manager, wherever you are to provide that to them in all situations. Well said, James, really well said. James, we're, um, I'm just looking at the clock and we yep. all know, know each other well. We could, we could talk forever. I'm going to have to speed things up a little yep. bit. Okay. Tell, tell us a little bit, James, about how that leadership, what you just talked about, how that military experience helps you here at the laboratory. Well, here, you know, um, I was initially hired here for my experience working on explosive weapons and ordnance. I worked in HEAF uh, for 10 years. Uh, however, I think the principles and values I learned in the Army, they come into play every day. Leadership, like I said, values of, you know, some of the values we learn as far, you know, our leadership a sense of duty, respect, honor, you know, uh, perseverance, selfless service, those kind of things come into play. Uh, I also, I think the countless hours of, we have formal graduate level leadership training, you know, as an operational training, but it's also learning how to deal with different personalities and use motivation to get results, you know, and understand the nuances of being a leader. You know, on the civilian side, I always say leadership's easy. Because at five o'clock it's over. Boom. See you later. Everybody's going home. But on the military side, you got these guys 24 seven. You still have to worry about clothing them, feeding them, putting a roof over their head and making sure they're staying out of trouble. So you really have to get out and, and know your guys and know your people, you know, and, um, I always say, you know, you, you can't lead from behind a desk. You know, you got to get out and pound the pavement. You got to get out there and know your people. What mo motivates them? You know, what, what, you know, some people want to pat on the back. Some people want to re reward. Some people want to be the best. Some people just want to belong to the team. You know, you got to know what drives people, you know, and some guys just want a day off, you know, so everyone's different and knowing that and knowing your people, understanding, you know, what drives them, but also understanding their value, what they bring to the team, because everyone has value that's where you're a leader, you know, and that's, uh, you, you just, you, you know, you have to be able to do that, but it also taught me how to follow as well. You cannot be a good leader without being a good follower, you know, cause, uh, there's a lot of folks who would sit there and whine and, uh, you know, I've always had a, what they call an open door policy, but I have always said, Hey man, you know, you can come in here. This is not a time to whine. If you come in to whine, I need, solutions you know i need courses of action you know doors always open come on in let's talk let's discuss but uh you know if you're just here to whine and have no solution then that's not going to do anything and then lastly uh sometimes leadership is, it's uh it's not a democracy you know sometimes you just got to go with what's there and 
I think people don't always understand uh, the strategy or the driving forces behind decisions sometimes. And at, sometimes at the lower level, you don't understand until you get, you know, closer to the flagpole and then understand and know that everything has a backstory and a reason. But um, the last part, I think that what I use every day is the diversity of, of uh, working with people. You know, the military is one of the first places to integrate. Um, they're not perfect at it, but I think they're on the right path. You know, we, we learn to see uh, what, what is important about diversity and what people bring. Like I said, we're accountable to each other. We're good teammates. We under net, understand that uh, significance of inclusion and equity. We're team players, you know, military. We emphasize all these different things, you know, we, we understand things and, and that's what we bring to the table. Yeah, James, thank you. I think I'm going to bring you in as a guest speaker when we have our le leadership training. Uh, ph phenomenal m message. Uh, uh, James, tell, tell us a little bit about the adversity you faced in your military career and in life. Woo. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, some of the biggest adversity I've faced have been uh, some form of prejudice, whether it was unconscious bias, being labeled, uh, simple fear misunderstanding or just plain old racism, man. Um, I've experienced it in the military. I've experienced it here. I've experienced it in the officer ranks, enlisted ranks, and here, and like I said, in the corporate setting. Uh, you know, it, it's, I've been everything from being described, you know, people always try to label you and they don't understand how sometimes that's demeaning. Like here at the lab, sometimes I'm, I'm described as the army dude or the football guy, you know, or in the military, the you know the 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 black officer or you know or you know this is on pas the best black officer or the first of something you know the first black officer and not just the best officer or you know what i mean it it's sometimes it's degrading you know and people sometimes don't even understand when they're trying to give a compliment that they're actually giving a it's a uh not really seen that way i mean i've I've been like here at the lab, I've been people, I've been mistaken for the janitor and literally had someone try to cuss me out for not taking out trash. And I'm like, yo, dude, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not the janitor. I had to correct him. You know, he definitely uh, knew at the end of the conversation that I wasn't the janitor, but he spe specifically knew that even if I was the janitor, you cannot talk to anyone like that. So, you know, I choose to take these moments and try to turn them into teaching moments. I've been called the N-word in my face in the military. And I tell people that and they're like, man, is he still alive? You know, and jokingly, yes. And I basically just, you know, I could easily turn it to violence and or something you know, like that. That's not the way to ha that I handle it. I, you know, looked the guy dead in his face and said, thank you for confirming what I already knew. But I'm going to beat that by professionalism, by diplomacy. Like I said, turning that into a teaching moment, educating people. You know, we need to have these uh, so-called awkward conversations, you know, about race and things. Don't be afraid. I will talk to anybody about any any topic, man. And, you know, it's, it's just a matter of mutual respect. Just good old-fashioned etiquette, man. Get back and not be afraid to talk to folks. But we also need to see the importance of, you know, stereotyping people, making assumptions or labeling people, you know. It's, right. you know, I've, I've had so many things from everything like, oh, you're, you're part Native American. So you get that Indian money. And I'm like, dude, I don't get a dime. I've, I've earned every, every bit of college, you know, that I've gone to, I've, you know, I've never received anything for being, you know, a race or people like, oh, you're, 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 you know, African American, get that Negro college fund or whatever. I've never had a dime. I don't even know where to get it. You know, there's, you know, there's no money there, but people make assumptions which is sometimes, you know, worse than just being racist, you know, because it, just just ask the question. People will sit down and explain things to you, and there's no need to be uh, afraid. We just have to have these conversations, especially now, you know. We need to be able to get back to having rational discussions and, you know, talking and, and being awkward. I'd rather be awkward than, you know, being uh, aggressive and violent or some other 
means that is non-productive. You know, we, we're here, we're all individuals, you know, everyone's experience, you know, um, you know, someone, someone who's African American or Native American, their experience could be totally different from mine. We're all different. We're all individuals, but we're all people and we can talk and we need to recognize the importance of our diversity and what we bring here and how it impacts individuals. Sometimes that we do things unwittingly and unintentionally, but it still can uh, hurt some, you know, everybody's not, not a strong person. And some people just, you know, may not understand how to deal with it. And some people may not even recognize that they're doing, but, but I do feel the lab, you know, no, no organization perfect. The military is not perfect. The lab is not perfect, but I believe both organizations are going in the right direction. You know, um, things are a lot better here. Um, I like what they're doing here with the DEI and I've been part of that with some of the, the folks here writing the strategy and discussing these things on training and how we can implement these things in the programs and management and, you know, just educating people on a whole. So that's something uh, that I think is very, very important. And those are some of the things that I've had to deal with. Thank you, James. It's, you've got a you've got a great perspective, and it's it's. Um, I think all all of us were listening very intently, and for me, I cannot relate to some of those things you just described. So it's very educational just to listen and to have these discussions. So I want to thank you, and on behalf of everybody, thank you for your per, your perspective. For the uh, for for the, for the audience, we're going to go a little bit over today. We've got a couple more questions, but I want to make sure James gets the opportunity to uh, for us to fit, finish this. So, um, if you have to leave, we 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 understand, but we're going to be probably another five to ten minutes. Um, James, why why is the lab a good place to work for veterans? Um, I think the lab is a great place for veterans uh, because of the overlap commonality of our national security missions uh you know some of our major customers and collaborators are dod we have some of the same missions um just at varying levels uh i think the lab uh is a place where uh, we can benefit and learn from uh, folks military experience especially combat their leadership discipline organizational skills um problem solving and solving problems in stressful situations, troubleshooting, coordinating, uh, crit creative and critical thinking. You know, um, there, there is a lot of experience that military people have on a, on a, on a whole that could contribute to uh, the success of the lab. I mean, that right now, you know, the majority of the military, there's 17, 25, 17, 26 range. And there are some young high speed people out there that are doing some high speed operational planning, everything from, you know, w you know, risk management and the things that we're doing here, the same frameworks, but just might have a different name are being conducted by these young folks. And they bring those things, that mentality to the table. They bring a strong sense of security, duty, honor. And, you know, uh, I think the lab definitely should continue to capitalize on that. I mean, it's just the value that uh, veterans bring, you know, we're, we're adapted to change. You know, we, we understand policy procedure and the significance of following those things. And we, we don't just sit idle, we take initiative. You know, we're, we're taught that from the beginning. Like I said, you know, we, we don't sit idle. We're, we're go-getters, we're doers, we're, we're out there. But I think that's, why the lab is a good place for veterans is the commonality of missions, the things that come in where uh, the frameworks that where they can just come in and almost instantly just jump into uh, the fire, so to speak, and start contributing from day one because they yeah. already understand these kind of uh, frameworks and operational stuff. Right. Great perspective, James. Thank you. I've got a couple things to add, but I, I want to give Car Carolyn a chance. Carolyn, I know you have a very full schedule. Um, are you able to stay with us, or do you need to uh, t take off? I'm I'm staying here. Uh, it looks like there was a great question in the chat uh, from Denise Malone. If if you can hit that question, uh, Sean, or if you'd like me to read out that question. But James, this has been very very interesting, and and uh, we can see how passionate you are, and how everything in your life ties together and coordinates. Carolyn, um, we uh, Carrie, if um, 
Carrie, you can either read the question or Carolyn, and then we've just got two more uh, quick questions. Yes, sure. Um, yeah, James, the question is, how did your family feel about you joining the military as opposed to um, going into sports or working in the community? Uh, my family was all for it. You know, um, my mom might not have been for it uh, right away because she really she wanted me to go to college. But I at the time I told her that was the only way I was going to be able to go. Um, but because of our history, you know, my uncles and cousins and everyone, you know, family members, um, they were they, they were for it. You know, um, we we've always been a family, like I said, that believed in service and duty and. You know, the words like honor are really big in our culture and uh, they, they were for it. They were proud. You know, if, if you've ever been to an Indian community, uh, they revere their veterans. You know, um, you know, you could go to a powwows or ceremonies at ceremonies. Veterans, you know, are believed to, you know, they, they possess power, you know, their strength, you know. Um, so it was something that was looked up to and, um, uh, uh, folks were proud of it, proud that I was going. Th thank you, James. James, um, just br briefly, how and, uh, why did you choose the lab over other options? Uh, man, I kind of found the lab by accident. Uh, uh. I had returned from a deployment, so uh, I have to back up a little bit. My my youngest son is uh, was diagnosed with autism back in 2004. I was or three. I was on my way to Iraq, um, and at the time I was living in Arizona. Arizona was rated number 48 in the states for special needs programs, education, etc. California was rated second. My uh, my ex-wife at the time was from California. Uh, we're looking for the best opportunity to, you know, provide to our son. So it's a no brainer, you know, so she, we literally packed our house, uh, the same day we kissed goodbye. She went to California. I went to Iraq and, um, uh, basically I, I said, I'll catch up, um, you know, get out there, get established, do what you need to do. And, uh, when I get back, I'll catch up. Uh, I was back and on leave and I was with my oldest son jj we're looking for a place to hike um so my we re relocated to tracy and i was looking for a place to hike and i was going through coral hollow hills over there and i started seeing explosive ordnance signs and um i had never even heard of the lab other than a movie i think it was a bruce willis movie uh 90s movie uh but i ran up on site 300 site 300 and i basically googled it I had no clue what it was like. What is this? Some kind of secret military base or something? And um, I googled it. Happened to see jobs, and uh, I applied for a few jobs, and uh, was contacted by Heath, uh, by Brian Cracciola actually at the time. And I interviewed my first couple of interviews over the phone while I deployed. While I was deployed, and um, it was the first place that I, I had never thought in a million years that I would ever get a job using. My explosives, uh, weapons experience, and like I said, getting to blow things up for a living, and it was a great opportunity, perfect timing. But uh, it was also um, just the technology, man, of, of knowing here. I'm really proud of you know working here. So some of the times I think you know part of it also was you know that I could come right in. Like I said, uh, I remember the first time was interacting with some DoD customers that were, you know. Some of the scientists don't often speak the language. We spoke the language and it was just a good fit. You know, um, seeing some of the technology and weaponry really that's developed here, some of the projects that I've been able to work on that, you know, I can say honestly that I'm probably one of the few people here that use that technology in combat, you know, and that pride, man, of, uh, that's another thing of being here, man, is, you know, I've had job offers other places and, it's just the pride of being on a team. And when you see the technology and things that are being developed here, you know, and right now, you know, I've worked in insurance and security, but it's just being part of that, part of that team, knowing and having been the guy on the ground who has benefited from that. You know, uh, I remember I used to get debriefed quite a bit. Um, the late Milt Finger 
uh, would debrief me and others when we came back from missions. And I was shocked at the, of the things that were being used that were developed here at the lab. And I had no clue that they were doing, you know, doing those things. Uh, you know, uh, the JDAMs, like I said, I was heavy on fire support. The JDAM programs we have here use those munitions. The CRAM, the, the counter rocket artillery mortar systems that were at Camp Taji, uh, you know, the FRAG 5 armor kits, guys that I later worked with that I did not even know were at Camp Taji, put outfitting Humvees that were protecting us, uh, were from the lab that were going there. Folks I knew from Building 140 later on that came in and went and deployed and provided intelligence support. You know, I've been a guy on the tip, the tip of the sword and that stuff matters and I want people to understand that, you know, sometimes you can get caught up in the madness and just consider this a job, but, you know, there's somebody out there who's really dependent on what you do and, you know, your, your, your contribution may seem incidental, but to that guy on the ground, it is life-saving because it creates a, you know, I used to joke, you know, with the, with the, when I got the armor kit, which was phenomenal. But I would close the door and I'd look out the little ballistic uh, glass there and it reminded me of, of the closing the gun tank or the spherical tank in heave, you know, and I would joke like, wow, now, now I'm the experiment, you know, but, yeah. but the, but that having that armor, having those things that were developed there, they create a, a psychological and physical layer of security of confidence for you to do your job. So. All those folks, all you guys that are working in those programs, you know, know that your your work means something to someone out on the ground, and they really appreciate. At least, at least I do. Anyway, James, what a great message. I mean, very. Uh, you're probably one of the only ones, like you said, that can actually deliver that message and have that experience of application of a lot of what you've done here and the people you've worked with and our products and actually application as a warfighter. Incredible. Hey, um, James, as, as, as we wrap up here, what do you, what do you like to do in your, uh, in your spare time? Uh, right now in word football, man, I love football. It's in my family. I've coached, I've coached, uh, from youth football all the way to college. I, I've, I've coached, uh, as high as the division one level as a, as a graduate assistant, but also at division two, I was, I coached at the university of St. Mary's, uh, while I was on a mission at, at Fort Leavenworth, but mainly coaching my son's teams from, you know, the photo you're, you're showing there, it's one of my favorite photos. It was my son's team back, you know, back when it was just fun, you know, there's no politics in it, it was just good old fashioned, you know, these guys listen to that, that photo. I'm really proud of that photo because almost every one of those guys in that picture have all gone on to play college football somewhere and are playing now or have just finished. But uh, football, staying active in my community, man, whether it's here in California in the Tracy area or back on, you know, in Arizona, I, um, spent a lot of time supporting my son. Um, uh, my oldest son who played division one football, he, he played at Dartmouth. He, he finished up. He was a uh, first team. He was all Ivy, an all Ivy tight end at Dartmouth. Uh, he graduated, uh, with his undergrad and. Um, engineering and an advanced degree in me mechanical engineering. And he's now playing his last year, like I said, at New Mexico State, my alma mater. So I support him every weekend. I've gone to a game um, going to New Mexico this weekend, actually to watch him play with Mar. And that's just it. I support my, my family and my kids. Lifting weights is another thing. You know, I'm into powerlifting and like to lift heavyweights. Not big on cardio lately. You know, got the, got the COVID 25, 30 going on here. Um, but you know, I, I like to lift weights, like to stay active and just be part of the community. But I also have been active here with the ERGs, you know, and getting a message out of trying to help recruit, um, native Americans, uh, vets and African American, uh, employees here, uh, for STEM. Um, you know, I've been active in those groups and either as a, a actual committee member or just supporting them in general. And. Uh, do everything I can to try to funnel good people here to the lab. That's that's me in a nutshell, man. But sport, football, family, it's yep. that's probably my priority. Thank you, James. Great uh, priorities and thank thank uh, thank you for sharing. So as we wrap up, um, what's what's next for you? 
Oh, just continue to serve, man. You know, finish with the military, you know, uh, it was time to go. I told myself a long time ago when it, it started to be not fun anymore or uh, a burden, you know, those the the those 15 mile road marches is getting longer and longer and those bags are getting heavier and you know it's uh the knees aren't the same anymore you know jumping out of a helicopter or something it's it's that's a young man sport so it was time for me to to go out to pasture so to speak so you know and let let some young the younger folks handle that we're in good hands uh but i can i can serve and continue to serve here at the lab like i said this national security mission is vital to our nation uh and i'm proud to be part of that you know and like i said I, i'll continue to do that i'll continue to champion uh dei and continue to try to help the lab grow but also commit to helping the youth of our country whether it's through sport or just general mentoring coaching etc that's that's it for me you know hopefully yeah. one day i'll be old man jones sitting on a rocking chair you know we're talking <laughs> all the way but uh, I'm not quite there yet. James, thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to hand it over to, to Carolyn for any closing comments and then I'll do fi final close. Car Carolyn, any 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 final thoughts? No, I would just again like to thank you for your service. This was an absolutely wonderful talk. Um, it, your passion for everything you do in your life and your family is evident. Um, thank you so much for sharing this with all of us. It sounds like we had a great turnout. We had over 80, between 80 and 100 people participate in the last hour and a half. And I, I just, I can't say thank you enough, James. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor. I, I really appreciate the time and uh, having been selected to do this. Thank you. Uh, in, in closing, Carolyn, thank you for taking uh, your valuable time in and supporting us for being here. I'd like to thank Charles, who had to who had to leave. I'd like to thank Janessa, Renee, and Carrie for doing all the work, all the work behind the scenes to make this happen. And last of all, I'd like to thank James um, as my friend, as a colleague, as somebody who uh, sets an incredible example for his children, uh, for um, all our colleagues here at the laboratory, how to live our life um, with purpose. So with James, thank you. Thank you for, the, for this time. And thank you everybody for, uh, Hanging on a few more minutes. We appreciate you. Bye, James. Go Aggies. <laughs> Bye, James. Thank you. Thank you.